Uh, teaching Italian American studies to, which is really interesting to students who are um, getting their master's degree in English uh, has been really, really rewarding. And it's been great to get their perspective of immigration because all of their family uh, emigrated from Calabria to America, uh, Argentina, Australia, but most of them came back after they made a fortune in New Jersey, for example, with gas stations. So all of them come from richer families than my poor family from the west side of Chicago, gang-ridden neighborhood uh, with Italians, Puerto Ricans, African-Americans uh, fighting for control of the neighborhood. Um, so they're all richer than me. I'm first generation college student. Uh, they're like second, third generation uh, college students. Their parents, their grandparents in many cases have already gone to university. So that's been really, really fun for me in my retirement uh, to be teaching Italian American studies there. So um, Italian, I'm not really a professor of Italian per se. Um, I taught for the last 10 years of my career, elementary Italian, because my department saw that my last name was, they, they said Sacco. So they said, your name's Sacco, we need you to teach Italian. But you know, I only spoke uh, Calabrese dialect and they said, no, we don't want that uh, being taught to our students. So they sent me for free to go to Florence where I learned Italian for one full uh, summer and then came back uh, one or two times for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So more, I'm professor of French, which as I mentioned, my grandfather has never forgiven me for. So here's the story of my family. Back in 2001, when I took my uncles to Miliarina in the Provincia di Catanzaro, real close to San Pietro Apostolo, which we'll call SPA. Uh, it's only 4.8 miles. Uh, if you take the, do the hike, like my family used to do from Miliarina up to San Pietro Apostolo, which is a bigger town in order to do business. So at that time, the, the mayor of Miliarina basically told us three important facts. Number one, we're all related. Whether we're in Miliarina, San Pietro Apostolo, Triolo, Serastretta, all, <laughs> all those little towns between La Mezia Terme and Catanzaro, basically we're all tied in one way or the other. The second thing was a revelation was that almost all the people of Miliarina, a village of 800 people, even today, basically went to Long Branch, New Jersey as their first stop, which is interesting because I thought, you know, my grandfather was like the godfather. He came over to the Lower East Side of New York City um, and then moved on to Pittsburgh and then to Chicago. But he and his best friend, Antonio Torquia, which I'm told is pronounced Tor Torsha here, um, Antonio Torquia and my grandfather left together in 1914 and they came to Long Branch. Now, the interesting story, if you get a chance to read my book, Growing Up Calabrese, is that my grandfather was the tax collector in Miliarina. And at the last minute, he ran off with the government tax collections to America. So, that's something that my family, half my family is ashamed of and the other half think that's cool. So my cousin Gene, for example, says that's my grandfather. Uh, so really proud of the fact that he ran off with, uh, with the uh, tax collections and the mayor knew Antonio Torquia and knew that he and my grandfather would get in trouble in America and they did. Later on during the Great Depression, I was telling Lisa and Beth, they both uh, went to jail in Chicago for selling phony insurance policies. Now it's, it's pretty bad in the Great Depression when you know, people you know, are eating scuttle and beans, uh, you know, 100 pound sacks of beans that they got from the government. 
uh, and and dandelions from their from their the their lawn that here they are uh, cheating people by taking their uh, their money and then when the family member died there's no money to go out to them so they both spent time in jail and finally within my book there's a great story which is entitled knife fight in the kitchen because uh, Antonio Torquia decided that when my grandfather was gone, he would go to his house, he had the key, and he would make long distance phone calls in the 1930s. So he ran up a bill, all of a sudden my grandfather finds a bill for over a thousand dollars of long distance phone calls. And when Antonio came over to the house, they got in a shouting match, Antonio pulled his switchblade, uh, Cesare Sacco, my grandfather, pulled his switchblade, and then they had a knife fight. And fortunately, I think my grandmother um, uh, basically hit hit somebody over the head with a frying pan and ended the fight right there. So that's one of the stories that I have there for you. So I'm not quite sure how long they stayed in Long Branch because. I find that my grandfather in 1917 was in Pittsburgh opening another business being a fishmonger, uh, selling fish from his cart that he basically delivered to the different residents. And there my uh, grandfather got into a little bit of trouble because the US government wanted to draft him for World War I. Uh, fortunately for my grandfather, he had proof that he had fought against the Turks in Libya in 1911 and 1912. And so he said, well, you know, I've already fought, so I don't have to fight again. And they said, yeah, we're drafting you, you have to go. So basically he said, well, I'm sending all my money, I I'm, I'm have all my money to take care of my wife and my daughter, so I can't leave. And so the government let him off the hook. The problem was my grandmother and my aunt were still in Calabria. He left without them, making her what they call uh, a vedova bianca. I don't know if you guys know that concept of white widows were basically Calabrian women whose husbands deserted them and went all over the world, Argentina, uh, Brazil, um, every, you know, everywhere. So my grandmother was uh, a vedova bianca until 1920 when she decided with money from family to go to Chicago where she evicted my grandfather's new family. She probably had a knife as well, went along with her frying pan. And so my grandfather had to get rid of his other family, uh, Irish woman, I don't know if there were kids involved. And so she reestablished the Sacco family where in 1920 and 1921, my uncle and my father were born and uh, were, basically opened up another business, a candy store on the south side of Chicago, and then moved to the northwest side of Chicago where I was born in 1952. So basically my life in uh, Chicago might've been a little bit different from you guys. They only spoke uh, Calabrese to keep secrets from us. We had to become Americanized. Cesare, for example, was the key first name for all the Sackos for 10 generations until my generation. My father married a non-Italian. It was called a mixed marriage in those days. And she had three strikes going against her. Number one, she wasn't Italian. Number two, she was Protestant, which was even worse. And number three, she smoked cigarettes. So everybody in the family called her La Putana. Uh, until my grandmother came over to the house and saw that she was immaculately neat and there and basically told the family, leave her alone, she's a good woman. So when I was born, my, my father wanted to name me Cesare after my grandfather and my mother said, hell no, that ain't happening. And so I'm named Stephen after nobody on either side of the family. And so Further generations after my cousins and now my second and third cousins, no one was named Cesare. So the name died in my generation. So it gives you an idea 
of the Americanization that took place. I learned Italian when I was 47 years old. I still don't speak Calabrese dialect fluently, which is my goal in 2022 when I go back. Plus I got $200,000 from 7,000 languages to develop an online Calabrese course, which would be free to anyone around the world who wants to learn uh, Calabrese. Now the big question is which Calabrese? Is it Cosentino? Is it from Catanzaro? Um, even in the our neighborhood, Milirina is right here. Amato is only two uh, miles away. And there's only 60% overlap in their dialects, only two miles away. So that's a problem that we have to solve. Uh, we're probably gonna choose one dialect and then we'll have dialectal variations that we'll have in our online course. So age 47, I learned Italian. I didn't go to Italy until I was 48 years old because all that time I was spending trying to be the best French professor I could be. So I lived in France. Uh, later on, we lived in Africa. Um, and so I didn't go to Italy until 19, uh, till two, 1999 and then, no, 2000, I went twice. And then in 2001, I took my uncles. So in my book, I describe how I rediscovered my family by you know, pulling in with uh, my wife and children in a Renault uh, van. We stopped in the middle of the street and I said, I identified myself in Italian and then people were hanging out the window and they were, and I, cause I was asking, are there any sacos left in the, in the city? And they all started yelling out the windows, do you know any of the sacos? And so they're all young. And then all of a sudden they pull out their cell phones and they start calling around to see. That's when we discovered Emily in Amato, which is two miles away. So when I knock on the door and I meet my uncle, or my cousin, it was almost like my dead uncle reappearing from the dead. They look like twins. And so during those two visits, we stayed there and we uh, compared family notes. And that's when they told me that my grandfather and my grandmother were first cousins. Okay, and then I find out that everyone there is a cousin, first, second, or third which is funny because my cousin, Kathy Marcico, who's on Facebook, my Facebook friend, she's in love with a guy named Enzo Celli. And when I warned her that uh, that's your cousin, she said, no, it can't be, please, please say it's not true. And it is probably true since everybody in Miliarina uh, is basically related. Now, the San Pietro Apostolo comes in with Brandon, and that's when I, I want Brandon uh, right after me to talk about what he's doing because he's my guru. He's the ancestry.com guru. And not only that, but he's the San Pietro Apostolo guru when it comes to all the records which he has painstakingly translated into English. Here's where Brandon comes in. In 19, I think it was 2019, Brandon calls me up, or my cousin Pam from Chicago calls up and says, yeah, there's some guy named uh, Brandon Dolecki, and I don't know how he's, uh, you know, our cousin, but he says he's our cousin. That's my Chicago accent coming out. Um, yeah, can you talk to him and find out who this guy is? And so Brandon and I talk, and after a while, Brandon helped me because at that point, my, all my records in Miliarina had either burned up in the fire of 1875. And I thought, oh my God, I can't go past my great grandfather. Brandon, within minutes, shows me records that my great grandfather and great grandmother on both sides had moved to Miliarina from San Pietro Apostolo. So that's the connection that I have with all of you because uh, so many of you have family that originally came from, we, you know, we, Brandon and I just call it SPA uh, to get away from pronouncing the Italian all the time. So Brandon is the guy who helped take my records from great grandparents, 
all the way to the 1750s. And if he, you know, keeps doing more research, he'll probably go back to 1464 when the town of Miliarina is founded. And a lot of people came from four little towns near La Mezia Terme at that time. So that's what I've been doing uh, for this time is, is trying to rediscover my family. Uh, I have a lot of them as Facebook friends that's expanded from Miliarina and SPA to family in Alexandria, Egypt, because we have family there, uh, as well as probably all of you have family in Alexandria who went there uh, to build the Suez Canal or were sent there for some kind of shameful activity that has take place. That's why one of my stories in Growing Up Calabrese is called Exiled to Alexandria. And it's about a 16 year old girl who's raped by uh, the pharmacist in the town who's also the most popular guy in town. And when the baby appears, uh, the family because of shame ships her off to be somebody's nurse, a nursemaid in Alexandria. And she never comes back uh, to her family in Miliarina. So that's the story that I got from Rachel, uh, one of my uh, cousins in Canada. So if you get a chance, uh, Growing Up Calabrese is, uh, relates to 100 stories, both in the United States and in Calabria, that talks about my dual identity as well as your dual identity of being a Calabrian and also an American. One quick story and then I'm gonna hand it off to Brandon. Um, in Chicago, we always had to identify ourselves kind of like dogs, you know, sniffing each other and determining whether they're gonna have a fight or not. But in Chicago, the big question was, what are you? Now, anywhere else in the United States, what are you? I'm a human being. So what are you? And that meant, are you Italian? Uh, if you were Italian, then there were follow-up questions. Are you Calabrese? Are you Sicilian? Are you Napolitan? Are you this or that? Uh, are you Abruzzese? And so then we knew that we were in safe company because Italians in my neighborhood never fought. So it's interesting. I use the word Italian as an identifier, but I'm a Calabrian American. I don't consider myself an Italian American. I consider myself a Calabrian American, but tell people who don't know where Calabria is or what it is that I'm an Italian Mar American, even though I teach Italian American studies at the University of Calabria. So we knew that when we were with other Italians that we were safe, we could go to their house and eat Italian style. Whereas my mother forced me to eat uh, Wonder Bread and you know Kraft cheese and all that kind of stuff. She forced me to have turkey at Thanksgiving when my family always had uh, you know, all different types of pastas. So I was kind of raised as a half breed, as a, as a Calabrese, but also as an American um, who pledged allegiance to the flag, went to military school, did all the things that uh, were expected of Americans at that time. So Lisa, if it's okay, can I hand it off to Brandon? to talk a little bit about what he does and then we'll field questions. Lisa, I think you're on, uh, you're still muted. Oh, there, uh, yes, that would be great. And Brandon, just uh, explain a little bit about who you are and that you live in Long Branch for those of uh, who are not familiar with you. And uh -huh. then uh, feel free to share your screen with your ancestry information. Okay, no problem. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, no problem. So I'm Brandon Delecki. I grew up in Long Branch. I'm 28 years old. I know some of you guys by name. So my family came from SPA, from my grandmother's side, and she's one of the Tomains that started also with the IAMA, their cousins, very close cousins. So doing family tree projects in school, I just uh, like this side because I grew up in Long Branch and all the names were from Long Branch themselves that I was doing the records for. So I decided I should just do like a little database on Excel. So I have access to familyhistory.com and that's where all the records are from the Mormons that 
did the digitalization. So I took all the records from there and I started translating from Italian to English. So right now my Excel database has about 8,000 records just from SPA from 1810 to 1910. And it's always adding once I add more stuff to them. And that's all I have for my story. Okay, so Brandon, you know, feel free to jump in with questions, especially if we get into the technicalities of uh, sure. looking for family records and stuff. Sure, I'm gonna drop my email address in the chat. So if you wanna reach out, I can look up stuff for you and you can just, I can just talk to you through email. And he's also Sorry. on Facebook like me. So um, you can, um, if you wanna be his Facebook friend as well as mine. Uh, some of you are already, I see, you know, Phyllis, my cousin, and Joanna, my cousin, uh, my sweet cousins, uh, they're my Facebook friends, as well as some uh, other names that I, I recognize. Some of the Sidianis. Uh, so, Tomaino, Sidiani, Mazza, Sacco, Esposito, uh, Torquia are all my family names, and there's others that probably Brandon uh, has found as well. So, I see a lot of uh, family names that are very, um, very, very uh, common to me. So Brandon, did you actually have anything you wanted to share on the screen as far as a uh, picture of your family tree or um, was there anything like that that you wanted to share? Otherwise, I'm sure everyone would be happy to get your email from the chat and I can also send it out if you email me, I can send it to you if you missed it. Okay. So you can uh, take questions, but if was there anything else you wanted to show us? Oh, that's all right. I'd rather just open it up so the public can interact and get some stories from others while we have time. Yeah, that's so what we can do is, uh, Brandon has my permission to be on my site. Uh, and so we can give permission to anybody who wants to look at uh, the family tree to see, um, you know, if there's, you have any family members in, in common. I know that when I went back to Miliarina and Amato, we would fold two sheets of, of paper in one and we would write our families and then we'd open it up and match it. And we saw that, wow, you know, we're related in so many different ways. All right, well, does anyone want to uh, unmute themselves? If we could I just do. try to do one at a time. I do. You use the function to raise your hand and uh, ask a question. All right, I've got, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. All right. Um, my maiden name is Torquia. My father's Francesco from Milarina. Uh, one of five children. I related to your story, Steve, about the wet nurse and, and being in Egypt because my great great grandfather and great great grandmother were in Egypt, and my great great grandfather was born in Egypt. She was a wet nurse while he was working on the canal. Uh, I have cousins that are still in Middle Milanina. I've gone back several times. Matter of fact, I'm going back in August um, to bury my father. My father's ashes are being put in the family mausoleum in Milanina. Uh, my cousin, about seven years ago, set up and did a family tree that I am sure would connect with half the people on this um, website. Um, I also have it available. It is very horizontal versus linear, if that makes sense. I have the connections that go, I guess, maybe back two or three generations, but it's very, very wide versus being very linear. Um, it doesn't go back that far because very few people before the turn of the century could read or write in the hometown. So they had to depend on whatever records were available. So I have whatever he could research. So I'm willing to share that with anybody also. Um, all the names are there. You know, all the Sacos, the Mazes, Esposito, they're all there. Polones, John's a distant relative. Uh, matter of fact, my great grandmother was a, was a Torsha married to a Polone. So cool. I got it right that time, John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If you want to put your email in the chat. I will put it in the chat. And I also, well, I have your email. John, um, are you are you Frank's brother? Yes, he is. Okay, yeah, cool. He's also our mayor, our mayor of Long Branch. Good to meet you. Yes, Steve. 
It's, in, it's a big tradition. Thanks. Yeah, and every, everybody in Emilia Arena is very proud of, of Frank, uh, you know, because, you know, they, they know him from being a congressman and stuff. You know, they'd like for him to do them some favors, but I don't think uh, Frank has the, the influence uh, in Emilia Arena like he has in, in New Jersey. I see Jean Tepper has her hand up. Jean, did you have a question or a comment? Okay, I, I'm just an interloper here. I'm not Italian. My family didn't come till basically World War II era. But anyway, why, I'm curious, why Long Branch? Why did all these people from your hometown come? Well, and who was the first family to come? I mean, were there people already here from the hometown when your grandfather came? And why, you know, yes. why Long Branch of all places? So, yeah, they, he came in, 19, in uh, June of 1914. And obviously he couldn't come over to America without a sponsor. And so he knew immediately once he got processed out of Ellis Island to head to, to Long Branch. And that's where he and Antonio. So I'm sure it probably went back to maybe 1860 when Italians started coming to America or the 1880s when they started coming to the East Coast. So probably there's a long multiple or multiple generational um, distribution before my grandfather arrived in 1914. I have a question. My name's Trish. I do, I do not have any Italian except I'm working on one of my cousins because she's half Italian and half Irish. And <clears throat> the question of why they got there, but I've seen uh, census records with uh, uh, some people that were in the Long Branch area. Uh, was there manufacturing or what kind of jobs would they have done? In Long Branch? Yes, in, in, in Long Branch. Yeah, Brandon, you might know that as well as when uh, Italians uh, started coming to uh, Long Branch. Gardening was very big um, with our families. Uh, so it was gardening. The ladies worked in um, factories, sewing, uh, sewing factories. Uh, those are what, what my grandparents had done. And talking about why Long Branch, my grandfather used to tell a story. He came over and he had to see the mayor of Long Branch and all due respect, John, it wasn't the formal mayor, but it was a Tamani last name. And he was like the magnet for all the Italians coming into this area. So he was the main uh, person that, that would come, that people coming into Long Branch uh, because this Mr. Tamane was um, the head of the Italians, the head of the Calabria, uh, those from Calabria coming over. Not the official mayor, John. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, know that, I know that my grandfather came at the turn of the century and he worked for the railroad that I do remember and he would go back because we went to Ellis Island to check records he would go back every two years and lo and behold each one of my uncles and aunts were born two years apart so he would go back she'd get pregnant he'd come back to the United States and he did that on and on. Now, my father is the baby of the family, and he was born in 1920. So my, fa my, my grandfather had to have been here, I would say, at the turn of the century. Terry, and he came I, to work for the, for the railroads. Terry, I think our grandparents uh, were the same. My family has the same story. Uh, Sam, my grandfather, Tut's father, would come over here go back and my grandmother would get pregnant. pregnant? Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know, uh, maybe Steve, you could, there was one story I, I thought was funny in our family. It was um, the, be uh, the beginning of World War II. My grandfather was here and supposedly, and I'm saying that because I, I'm not 100% sure of the story, um, that they would give free passage to the Italian national men back to Italy. And my grandfather's best friend was uh, Frank Falvo, who was also um, my oh, aunt, uncle, Susie, and Peter Falvo, his father. And they went back to Italy. And when they got to Italy, they were put right into the Italian army. Yeah. Is that, does that yes, sound? Yeah. Uh, that I haven't heard of, but I can tell you that um, all of us here who come from SPA or Migliorina, 
we had, this is going to be kind of like unheard of since the American Civil War. We had family who died fighting for the Nazis, not that they wanted to. Yeah. So I have a, a great cousin, Cesare, who died at Stalingrad. And yet there's my father who was in the Army Air Corps. My uh, uncle was in the Navy. So here you've got Americans fighting for the Allies, and you've got Italians who were all, there's nobody volunteering in Miliarina to go to no. Russia. And so there's quite a few people in Miliarina. In fact, there's a, a monument to them who died during World War II fighting for the Axis powers, unfortunately. Yeah. My family came over, my family finally came over, my grandmother with my aunt, my father in 1920, uh, was born 20, 29, 1929. Wow. That's he, he was lucky to get over here because in, uh, right after 1920, they put uh, the limitations on Italians coming over uh, in, in light of Sacco and Benzetti. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, no, no relation. Mm -hmm. One, uh, if I may tell one one story, um, uh, it's the community of the those from Saint Peter the Apostle, and I butcher it in Italian. I apologize. I like the SPA, um, but it started with um, and back then when I was a kid, um, um, back in the seventies, um, traveling back and forth to Italy wasn't as common as it is today. Going back to the hometown wasn't as common, or at least to me it wasn't. But Angie Bonafort, who was married to Rocco Bonafort, Rocky Bonafort, went back to St. Uh, SPA. And when they came back, they were uh, called a meeting of uh, people from St. Peter's, St. Peter the, the Apostle. And they started a fundraising dinner dance um, every year. I think it ran for about 10 years to restore the church. So if you go back to St. Peter the Apostle and go to the church uh, and see that the building and the facade is rather old, but the pews are rather new, that, that money came from Long Branch. That was the money. And each year they would send money over, uh, paint the, uh, the inside of the church, paint the outside of the church, refurbish it, the roof. And the last thing, if I'm not mistaken, was they bought those pews. And uh, my brothers, um, uh, my brothers, uh, Monsignor Sam Siriani and Father Anthony Siriani had a, uh, a bus load of trip people uh, go there. We had two buses and we stopped in St. Peter the Apostle and we had mass there. And you could tell these are new. They, they were not the original from way back when. Uh, and these were the ones that my uh, that this community put together. The dinner dances were held at my family's restaurant in West End. And it was really the uh, those from St. Peter the Apostle pulling together to raise money to send back to the home country. And a lot of them, their families themselves were baptized in that church. So there was really a, a strong connection for them. Michael, can I just add something there? Yes. Both your church and mine, which is the Church of the Rosario in Miliarina, most of our families are buried under the church. Oh, I'm sure. Their bones were thrown there. And I found out in reading a, a history of Miliarina that in, 18, in 1806, uh, the Emperor Napoleon decreed that throughout the empire, you had to stop burying people under the church. <laughs> Uh, well, obviously in Calabria, the word got down uh, or we decided to disobey the emperor. So it was quite a while. And so the last person buried under the church, my church, where my grandparents got married on April 17th, 1913, is a Saverio Sacco. Mm -hmm. um, so when I couldn't find in the church, in the church uh, cemetery, I said, where the hell is my family? And they said, they're all under the ground. They're all under the church. So they would die. They would just throw the bodies down there after the funerals and lock it back up. And then they would go down from time to time and it would all be bones like, uh, you know, like in Rome or in Paris. I like the catacombs. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I wonder if, you know, back in your church and SPA, if they have, 
if they have talked about who was buried under the church versus buried in a cemetery. I heard everything above ground <laughs> growing up, you know, watching them um, uh, report back. I don't think anyone ever went downstairs. One thing that they did do when they, they were painting, when they were painting the uh, church, they were removing some of the uh, uh, debris that was on the walls and they found a fresco on the wall. And that was wow. a very big um, find uh, wow. at that time. All right, I want to jump in. I see Anthony Tallarico has raised his hand. Anthony, did you have a question or comment? Yes, I did. First of all, this is absolutely fantastic. I don't think you realize how happy you've made so many people to put this together and to know that there's a resource out there for people to hopefully connect uh, in between illiteracy, poor record keeping, uh, name changes. There's such a, a difficulty to connect family. So, sir, thank you very much. And you and Brandon, I'll be emailing you uh, a lot. Please. So I'm a, I'm a Tallarico from Rockwell Avenue. I see my cousin, uh, Chelsea, whose uh, family was from Rockwell and 7th Avenue. And I'm also a Tarantola, my family owned Rex restaurant. We'll just separate and apart from that. Do you have any stories or does anyone have any history on the uh, Rusamano? I heard a lot of stories growing up of this organization that may or may not have existed and it may have been related to Long Branch. Do you have any stories that I could put together on that, sir? Uh, I don't, but I'm hoping people here do. Mayor? Someone's got to know about the Russomano. No. I don't. Well, I'm going to try to find out. Evidently, they were a group of Italian gentlemen that got together and make their own set of rules. Um, and I, I have a following of them and then at some point they fizzled out, but I'm very curious as to where they, where they went. And I'm very interested in how, you know, how Long Branch was back in the thirties and, and twenties, you know? I'd be very interested in that too. I'll find something. I'll send it to you, sir. But f first of all, thank you very much for putting this together. My pleasure. Hey, you know, at some point I'd love to hear, uh, Lisa said there's a possibility that I could come back, but I would love to hear Long Branch, Vengeance, and, um, and Family Feuds versus Chicago ones, because mm -hmm. um, in, in my family, we had three generations fighting because it started with somebody picking on my cousin. Uh, his, her brother came and beat the guy up in his own bedroom. Uh, the guy, the father beat up my cousin. My uncle went over and beat up the guy in his own uh, house. And then my grandfather, the two grandfathers uh, duked it out. Uh, three generations in the house fighting over one slight. Hmm. So those are the kinds of stories I'm trying to collect for my next book. Um, that would be Calabrian stories, both in the United States and uh, in, in Calabria. I see that Michelle has her hand up. Michelle Shapiro, did you have a question or comment? Yes, um, I'm. Uh, my my heritage is from Valle Fiorita, Provincia di Catanzaro, and um, we're the Signorellis and the Ramondis, and uh, the Trulias from Palermiti. But um, yeah, I have I have stories about the church too, when I went to visit um, Valle Fiorita and found that most of my relatives were under the, under the church instead of above ground. Um, and also some very uh, good stories about fighting. <laughs> yeah, in fact, we were all boxers in my family. Um, <laughs> my, my father fought in the army on the same fight card with Joe Lewis and wow. uh, was a trainer of Olympic fighters before he died in 1970. I, we all had to be fighters because, you know, that was our Italian heritage was to box. <laughs> How close is your town to uh, Valle Fiorita? I'm Do not you... familiar with that town, unfortunately. I'd have to look at it on, a, on the map. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank you, uh, Michelle. We're getting close to our uh, time. Maybe we can take a couple more questions or comments. If anybody has something they'd like to contribute. 
Uh, who's that? Anyone next? Raise your hand or jump in. Hi, I'm Linda. And Hi. I'd just like to thank you. I am on Long Island, but uh, we don't have that many Calabrians out here on Long Island. But um, I'm glad I was able to find your site in Long Branch and hear about your interesting stories. I have traveled to Calabria. I was in my family's hometowns of San Vincenzo, La Coste, and um, I didn't make it over to Montalto Ufugo, but um, I hope to go back at uh, another point. But it's been fun listening to your stories, and I'll try and find your book. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it's on, um, on Amazon. Good. And then I, uh, we're writing a book with my students for their stories, and that'll be coming out uh, through Rubettino, which is a Calabrian press. But I'll let you guys know when that comes out. It'll come out in like June. Great. And we'll get a copy, a couple of copies at the library for sure, too. So folks can borrow them if they like that way. Uh, Donna Lisa, you have your hand up. Hi, this is, I'm, I'm talking for Donna Melissa. This is Margaret DeMarco Penta. My dad was born in Cala, um, Calabria in a little town of Perito near Cosenza. My mother met him at Fort Monmouth. He was a prisoner of war. I just was able to join now. Are we gonna have another session? Cause I have such beautiful stories to tell. I spent so much time there. It was absolutely amazing. And having my father as a prisoner of war, it's just an amazing story how his, he was just, the United States put his arms around him when he came here. Is there gonna be another session? Well, we would sure like there to be. Uh, there seems to be a lot of interest and a lot more stories and sharing that we could do. So uh, hopefully with Steve, I know you have another book coming out. And also October is our Italian American Heritage Month and the library does like to do something for that. So I think a uh, second session is a strong possibility. Yeah, that would be uh, wonderful. It sounds and like there's gotta be a long branch book that should come out on stories of immigration um, in Long Branch. Please get in touch with me. I have the everything. My mother wrote everything out and it was absolutely an amazing story. She met him at Fort Monmouth. He was a prisoner there. Wow. And she went to go see her cousins and she met my dad and went back to Italy to marry him and came back later. But there's such wonderful stories about Calabria. Wonderful, thank you. Again, I'd like to say you can email me, Lisa Kelly, at the Long Branch Public Library. My email was on the flyer, or you can call the library and speak with me, and I can always hook everyone up who wants to reach Steve or Brandon. Um, so don't worry if you don't have, you know, the right contact info. I'd be happy to provide that for anyone who wants to reach out and exchange some stories. Thank you so much. Are you Alex's mom? <laughs> yes. <laughs> love yes, that. Okay. I'm Alex's mom. <laughs> okay, thank you. I loved all your information. Thank you. Welcome. All right, let's see. One more. Um, we're almost to eight o'clock. I'd like to keep it to an hour. Uh, is there anyone else who has anything they'd like to share or ask Steve or Brandon? I got to share. Uh, my father served in World War II, and he was there for the Italian campaign. I've got his diary. Wow. And uh, I, I put a copy at the Monmouth County Archives, also down here in Virginia at our state archives. But if you're interested, I would be glad to share a digitized copy of it. He That's basically good. went through North Africa to the Sicily and then up through Rome. He was on the steps of St. Peter's uh, listening to the Nazi uh, talk about the invasion of Normandy. And then he was stationed in uh, Rome for the, the rest of the war. Yeah, that's, that's kind of like a band of brothers that probably needs to be put into a book. I reading agree. His hand, reading his handwriting is quite difficult. Trust me on that. It's an accountant. Well, I can yeah, help. I do have, I the, I do have the diary. Yeah. yeah, Brandon and I are handwriting experts. Italian handwriting. Well, I, uh, I have a question. So, for Brandon and uh, yourself, Steve, at the 
uh, Mormon libraries, are you able to go just there? With just one one Elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis have an increased risk of death or stroke. Call doctor about unusual changes in behavior or suicidal thoughts. Antidepressants can increase these in children and young adults. Sorry. Is it coming? I don't know who's that. Okay, I just muted everyone. So Steve and Beth and Brandon, unmute the, yourselves and anyone else who would like to ask a question, please unmute yourselves. Thank I you. Had a, I had a question for Brandon and Steve. Um, so with the libraries that you use, are they open during the pandemic or do you have access from your house to look up those? And by the way, the, if you can read those handwritings and uh, those uh, from the 1810s and stuff like that, that's uh, my hat's off to you. Uh, so that's a good question, Ron. So for me, I have access online so I can view it from my house. So I know a Mormon who is a church member, so I have her login. So I can do stuff from my house that most people have to go to the church for. So that's why I have so many records uh, hand typed into the computer at 8,000 for SPA. Okay. Yeah, and oh, when this I is use Trish Mormon, again. I'm a librarian and cool. yes, you can go, you can do familysearch.org from your home computer. You have to register, but it's all free. Great, thank you. Hi, Brandon. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Frank. Hey, what's up, Cuz? Thank you for the invite. No problem. Um, basically, uh, I met the <laughs> I met Brandon through our ancestry.com uh, when we came up with the matches on uh, 23andMe. Um, basically, uh, for some reason, my father has a history with Long Branch. I still haven't figured it out, um, and I'll get there. Um, Brandon knows that I'm a screenwriter, uh, being a retired officer, and I currently uh, wrote a script called Known Score Data May, uh, which won uh, Best Screenplay at the Biggest Movie Awards, as well as Tokyo. It's basically a story about my father being orphaned at 12 years old with four younger sisters uh, in Italy during uh, right before World War II and, and the struggles and stuff, but it's basically a a truly a Calabrian story about him as an Italian soldier, uh, how they had to uh, hide from the Germans at night uh, and uh, during the day, and they would travel at night to get back home to uh, Katora, which is outside Chicala. So that's my little Calabrian story for you guys. Great story, Frank. Love to read that. All right, I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. It's eight o'clock. Oh. Longer than an hour. Uh, Steve, Beth, I'd like to say something close your Thank you. I muted everyone again. So, yes. Um, we will try, we will have been recording, so this will eventually be posted on the library's YouTube channel, um, which is very easy to find, just search Long Branch Public Library on YouTube. We have many other videos, program videos, book videos, story times, crafts on our YouTube channel. And uh, just a quick reminder that while the library is closed, for inside browsing right now, we are doing a very robust curbside delivery service of uh, books, DVDs, and CDs. And we, cannot, we are also providing printing services. So please uh, reach out to us if you'd like to borrow any materials or if you need things printed. And we will deliver it uh, safely, socially distanced uh, out front of the library. So. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I hope you enjoyed the program and hearing these stories of Calabria. And I want to thank Steve for joining us tonight, finally, after almost two years, I think, we first started discussing this. And Beth, and we, Beth hung in there. Lisa, can we do that program? Lisa, let's do that program. So we finally did it. And again, I thank you all for joining us tonight. And please, 
questions, contact info. I'm your resource for putting you together with uh, our presenters tonight. So I, I hope you all are doing well and uh, it's almost the weekend. So I'll say have a nice weekend and have a pleasant evening and please join us for more of our virtual programs. And so good night. Good night Thank everyone. Stay safe. Great Jump to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye everyone. Good night. Good night.